Hunter Biden paid for this woman to do this with him, to travel across state lines from California to Washington, D.C. on June 15th. This is a violation of the Mann Act. This was prostitution. This, this is evidence uh, Chairman, Mr. Of, Mr. of Hunter Mr. Biden Chairman, making sex, hey, excuse me, this is my time, making of, okay. pornography. Should we be displaying this, Mr. Chairman, in the committee? Get a lady's time's expired. If the chair, if the gentlelady from Georgia wanted to follow evidence, we should also take a look at hypothetically a case where sex trafficking charges against a 17-year-old girl potentially. Uh, the gentlelady's time's expired. And we're having a hearing today as to why people who are American, they are American, do not deserve health care. They're here lawfully. They pay more taxes than Facebook does. They pay more taxes than many of our corpor federal corporations do. They pay for... DACA recipients pay for members of Congress's health care more than Facebook does. And we are sitting here having a hearing and saying we're going to return that favor by stripping them of their ability to engage in Medicaid when they are the ones that are changing our grandparent sheets in a nursing home. If there's any individual that believes in stripping Medicaid from DACA recipients, I would like to know if they are willing to give the $6.6 .6 billion that DACA recipients pay in federal taxes back to them. Are we willing to refund the $3.3 billion in state and local taxes that they pay back to them so that they can afford their own health care? We cannot let the poisonous ideology of anti-Semitism permeate into policy decisions that impact the lives of millions of Jews around the world. Additionally, those who dismiss 9-11 uh, dismiss as some people who did something? Are you kidding me? It was a terrorist attack. It wasn't some people doing something. As also, as a fellow New Yorker, I think one of the things that we should talk about here is also one of the disgusting legacies after 9-11 has been the targeting and racism against Muslim Americans throughout the United States of America. And this is an extension of that legacy. Consistency, there is nothing consistent with the Republican Party's continued attack except for the racism and incitement of violence against women of color in this body. I had a member of the Republican caucus threaten my life, and you all and the Republican Republican caucus rewarded him with one of the most prestigious committee assignments in this Congress. Don't tell me this is about consistency. Don't tell me that this is about an a, a condemnation of anti-Semitic remarks when you have a member of the Republican caucus who, have who has talked about Jewish space lasers and an, an entire amount of tropes and also elevated her to some of the highest committee assignments in this body. This is about targeting women of color in the, in the United States of America. Don't tell me because I didn't get a single apology Time has expired. when my life was threatened. Thank you. All I gotta say is I can't go out to lunch in Florida in my free time, not doing anything, just eating outside, and it's wall to wall Fox News coverage. And then you have a member of Congress engaging in sexually lewd acts in a public theater, and they got nothing to say. Earlier today, one of our colleagues, a gentleman from Florida, presented up on this screen something that looked, appeared to be, a screenshot of a text message containing or insinuating an explosive allegation. Jim Biden says, this can work, you need a safe harbor. I can work with your father alone. It'll probably take several months and everybody can read the text. Ms. O'Connor, Mr. Dubinsky, if you saw a text message like this between the president's brother and the president's son, wouldn't you be concerned about them trying to give plausible deniability for the president of the United States to not have any knowledge of said business dealings? It's worth Gentlemen, time's expired, but please answer the question. It's worth investigating. That screenshot of what appeared to be a text message was a fabricated image. It was a fabricated image. I don't know 
where it came from, I don't know if it was the staff of the committee, but it was not the actual direct screenshot from that phone. And in fact, I would like to submit to the committee the actual full context from, as a, from the Ziegler affid Affidavit Number 1, Exhibit 402, of the full text of that exchange. Do I have permission from the chair? Importantly, what was brought out from, from that fabricated image excluded critical context that changed the underlying meaning and allegation that was presented up on that screen by this committee and by, by members of this committee. My amendment prohibits oil and gas leasing on federal lands in a way that would increase even further our net carbon emissions. Educate yourself on how America attained its low emissions. If you care about the air quality, you care about climate change. Natural gas is what got America there. Educate yourself on that. Go and learn. Go and learn for yourself about this. The chair would remind all members to address their comments during the various debates to the chair. While I cannot control the fact that the other side seems to have made the assumption that I am uneducated, uh, one of the things that I can say or you know, what, what they may say about my worldview. One of the things that I can say is that while I may not work for Wall Street, that is true. I may not be here with the mission to increase profits for corporations, that is true. My mission here is for the well-being and dignity of our family and our planet's future, for our children's ability to live on this planet. That is what the, this amendment is about. This is just an effort by the left, by the Biden administration, to continue to push their Green New Deal and to continue to take control over our everyday lives. Would you obey a ban on gas stoves? I mean, there's gotta be a limit to what people are gonna put up with. But they're gonna keep pumping this forward as quickly as they possibly can to eliminate stoves, to eliminate gas. No secret, government agency is gonna bust down your door and take your gas stove away. This is about a decision about what may be sold and regulations in the far future. You ladies and gentlemen interfered with the United States of America 2020 presidential election, knowingly and willingly. They send you all kinds of emails. They send you documents on the super secret James Bond teleporter. You get information on that. So much of the evidence of wrongdoing from this family is located in that hard drive. It's just a, an abuse of public resources, an abuse of public time. We could be talking about health care. We could be talking about bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. We could be talking about abortion rights, civil rights, voting rights. But instead, we're talking about Hunter Biden's half-fake laptop story. I mean, this is an embarrassment. Has because shown a... Who, who, who do you not trust to bring a firearm uh, in, into a committee room or anywhere else? In, in, I believe in that from what I've witnessed, um, the competence of some members may be something that I would be willing well, to question. I think you should give Thank us you. names before the sun goes down because we're all in great danger if you're correct. But if you're going to name names, I'd like you to present the evidence as well. We're having a hearing right now and it's about that the federal government is too woke I mean, that's seriously what we're hearing. And then there's no definition of what woke is, but on paper, what's actually being criticized in this hearing is that uh, the, the so-called woke policies are remote work for federal workers, especially those that live in rural areas um, and those who have disabilities, uh, paying interns so that critical opportunities don't just go to privileged kids whose parents can afford to, to pay for their rent while they, while they go on a free internship. That's, that is what is woke here. That is what the other side is calling woke here. The DC City Council decided to now give illegal aliens the right to vote. Giving this right to illegal aliens as if our government is the Oprah Winfrey show. You get a vote, you get a vote, you get a vote. But when cities in Vermont pass the same provisions, when San Francisco, when nine Maryland cities brought up this provision, did the Republican Party corral all of Congress and bring this issue down to the floor for a vote? No, they did not. They are singling out the residents of the District of Columbia and expanding in the history of disenfranchisement that goes all the way back to the legacy of slavery, rich, so rich to hear 
the other side, discuss the sacred right of voting, discuss the, what our, our veterans and, and our service members fought for in the sacred right of voting while defending and continuing to defend the disenfranchisement of American citizens in D.C. for their right to vote. What are the Democrats so afraid of? This is about transparency for the American people. And it is long past time for Joe Biden to take into account this harmful impact of this failed far left agenda. Whether it was canceling the Keystone XL pipeline on his first day in office to push his out of touch and costly Green New Deal regulations, Joe Biden has fueled this inflation crisis and caused this inflation crisis working with the previous radical socialist Democrat uh, majority. While Republicans have labeled virtually any federal spending during, during the pandemic as inflationary, while railing against the child tax credit that helped babies continue to be fed and diapers on their bottoms, that helped families stitch things together while they've railed against the eviction moratoriums and the Paycheck Protection Act, Moody's analytics found that the American Rescue Plan prevented this country from slipping into a double-digit recession. Republicans have controlled this body for almost two months and have not passed a single bill that would actually address inflation or cut costs from working families. But you know what Democrats did? In January, we capped the price of, of insulin at $35 so that everyday working families can actually get a little bit more ahead. This isn't just about continued cuts to the poor and to the working class in our essential services, but we can raise revenue. In fact, in tax cuts in 2017 passed by the uh, other side of the aisle, we see wonderful tax cuts for yacht owners and private jets. But in order to balance our budget now, we're talking about cuts to snap, to food out of babies' mouths, instead of actually re-examining the inequities within our tax system. Are you presently a registered lobbyist in the state of Minnesota for Twin Metals Minnesota? Let me explain it to you. Is I, it yes or no? I'm gonna give you a yes or no. We have two witnesses uh, that have connections, present connections, not past, uh, in stakeholders with a financial interest in advocating for large new mines in the state, regardless of whether or not it would result uh, in economic benefits. I think this is important and relevant connections that should be clearly communicated. We're here discussing rolling back a regulatory state, not even pointing out a specific area. Not even a specific area. I mean, what are we here for? People discuss the term regulation. What these are are protections for people, often who have no one else to protect them, who do not have a, a corporate legal team to protect them, who have endured loss, who have endured disease, fertilities, cancers. This is why we have regulations. One last uh, note of business. I'd like to say thank you to the many groups and organizations that reached out in anticipation of this hearing today with letters outlining their stances on the issue. I'd like to enter into the record letters to the committee from the American Tort Reform Association, American Pro Property Casualty Insurance Association, the Advanced Medical Technology Association, the Institute for Legal Reform, the International Legal Finance Association, National Association of Manufacturers. I, I, I think for the listing of all the special interests involved in addition uh, in this um, in this hearing. And if we're going to talk about third parties, let's talk about the Federalist Society, which has not only had deep ties to Justice Clarence Thomas and his wife Ginny, but has also helped choose judicial nominees for the Republican Party and directed multi-million dollar media campaigns to confirm them, including a multi-million dollar media campaign for Justice Alito, who uh, seems to like using the Wall Street Journal as his personal press secretary. We're supposed to sit here on this side of the dais and to the ranking member, to ranking member Lee's point, see a, a party that has voted against women's access to abortion, voted against our right, the Lilly Ledbetter Equal Pay Act, voted against the Violence Against Women Act, voted against our right to have access to contraception, and also doesn't even vote for equal funding, equitable funding in women's sports. And I'm supposed to believe that this is who's looking out for my best interests? I think not. As a former middle school principal, he understands the difference between a locked door 
and a fire alarm. To suggest somehow he was confused is laughable. As the video evidence shows, he did push the door, and it being locked, it didn't open. But he then took down the signs, threw one on the ground, carried one, walked over to the fire alarm on the wall, and pulled the fire alarm. It didn't say, pull to exit. Mr. Chair, I think the Republican side of the aisle made the case quite clearly today as to why we should not vote for censure. Uh, right now, you can tell how weak their arguments are because they are grasping for straws, trying to do their best My Cousin Vinny impersonation as to breaking down what happened here with a fire alarm. Jamal Bowman has more courage in his pinky finger than the entire Republican Party put together, more integrity than the entire Republican Party put together. And that's exactly why they're moving to censure him today. President Biden and my friends across the aisle want to continue to exceed America's credit card limit without any consideration of how or why we got here. Since the first day of the administration, this Biden administration has recklessly spent taxpayers' dollar. And as a result, as I say, you see inflation at record highs, stealing money and opportunities from hardworking Americans. The three main pillars of this legislation will benefit hardworking Americans by limiting federal spending, saving taxpayer dollars, and growing the economy. Well, well, well. Several years ago, we warned during the Trump tax cuts that this dramatic decrease in revenue would explode the nation's debt. And we heard from the Republican side, no, let us write off our yachts. Yet let us write off our private jets. And we said that this decrease in revenue would explode our, and, and explode our, our national debt. But instead now of realizing the error of our ways and reversing these tax cuts for the wealthy, we are now seeing the Republican side promote a, a bill that cuts student loan cancellation, veterans health care, cancer research, opioid treatment, meals on wheels, and more. The debt limit is about meeting our obligations already voted for, that Republicans and Democrats have already voted for. And if we want to cut and make changes to programming in the future, we may do that. But this and threatening to General change the economy is not expired. how we do it. Thank you, and I yield back to the chair. There is this hostility to traditional values that is seeping into the public schools today. They get this because some members of the schools, too many, and you can hear it from that side of the aisle, are obsessed with racism. The other side wants us to become a progressive group of people. And whatever progressive stands for, I would have to say it's hostility religion and ever-growing government, where the government's more and more responsible for everything in society. When we talk about progressive values, I can say what my progressive value is, and that is freedom over fascism. Look at these books that have already been banned due to Republican measures. The Life of Rosa Parks. This apparently is too woke by the Republican Party. Song of Solomon is, is unacceptable to Republican politics. Ms. Ashland, in Mr. Atencio's written te testimony, he mentions that your company, Enduring Resources, spilled over 40,000 gallons of toxic fracking slurry mixed with crude oil onto his family's allotment near Chaco Canyon. Do you dispute this fact? In, enduring resources. Has informed me that the spill did not occur on, the, on Mr. Atencio's allotment. It did occur, there was a spill in 2019. It was about 300 barrels of oil and about 1,000 barrels of water. It was cleaned up immediately and it was so the spill did occur the, of 40,000 it was in the middle of february and it was the resulted from a frozen pipe and but you dispute that it touched mr atencio's allotment i've been told that it did not mr atencio was this spill on your allotment yes uh, my father's uh, my father's allotment okay. for the last 4 years democrats have controlled both chambers of congress but in that time not one single piece of serious legislation was ever introduced which would have lowered the cost of energy. So what has been done to help ease energy costs? What solutions do my friends across the aisle have? What does this bill do instead? 
It's almost as if you gave a pen to an oil lobbyist and wrote down everything that they'd want. Much of that was in this bill. We are looking at reducing big oil's royalty rates to the public, slashing interest fees. In this bill, Republicans are squarely on the side of fossil fuel companies. It makes it harder for communities to fight big oil when they don't want them drilling in their own backyards. In, it also threatens our public lands and allows anyone to stake a mining claim on our public lands for less than $10 an acre even if they haven't discovered any minerals. You know, I've sat here for much of today and listened to many of my colleagues, particularly those on the opposite uh, side of the aisle, introduce amendments and legislation that conveniently benefit the fossil fuel industry while fear-mongering about things like the Green New Deal and positive climate action, to which I say, boo. Last year, four of the major oil companies, Shell, Chevron, BP, and ExxonMobil, posted record profits totaling $75 billion. Speaking of $75 billion, yesterday it was announced that Chevron will spend $75 billion on buying back their own stock after reaping record quarterly profits profits in 2022, driving up their own stock prices and padding CEO compensation. This reckless Wall Street profiteering at the public's expense and the planet's expense should have consequences. Capitalism. I understand General Lady across the aisle doesn't like capitalism, but capitalism provides benevolence in so many ways. This amendment's anti-free market. So I urge my colleagues to vote no on the amendment. The oil industry already possesses more than 9,000 unused drilling permits on federal lands. Nearly 5,000 of those permits were approved in 2021 alone. The oil industry already has at least 10 years worth of unused leases at its disposal. They are only producing oil or gas on roughly half the area that is already leased. And there are nearly 14 million acres onshore and more than 9 million acres offshore that are currently under, under lease but are not being used for oil production. Why lease even more? This amendment would limit clean energy, American produced clean energy and increase emissions heavy foreign energy. American oil production is the cleanest in the world, where it's produced and where it's used. When we talk about education, we should all take it upon ourselves in this body to educate ourselves on the science of the challenge of climate change that is before us. By around 2050, we are looking at, at the Western states to be projected to further increase, uh, wildfires to further increase two to six times. And that is just scratching the surface. We don't even need to look towards the future to understand the cost of climate change. In 2021, the federal government estimates that 20 different natural disasters that year alone cost the nation an estimated 145 billion and killed no nearly 700 people. The only way to guarantee consumers reliable, affordable energy is for the United States to invest in renewable energy. It's also the only way to protect our country from increasingly devastating weather events and rising temperatures. I urge the adoption of the amendment and yield back. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Mons, for joining us here today. You know, I would be remiss um, just for us to put into context what this hearing is about. And we are having a hearing about why we should not proceed with health care coverage and Medicaid coverage to DACA recipients, people who are lawfully here in the United States. And we are having this hearing on the heels of Governor Abbott in Texas uh, issuing an order to Texas troopers to push children and infants into the Rio Grande, Rio, Rio Grande uh, River, and now we're having a hearing today about why we should push people who were brought here as children off of health care coverage. I cannot proceed without saying that denying health care to anyone, I believe, is morally repugnant. Um, but moreover, 
I also wanna highlight a little bit of the relationship here that the United States has with DACA recipients. Uh, Dr. Montz, are you aware of how much in federal or state or local taxes that DACA recipients pay? I'm not. We've, DACA recipients uh, pay about $6.2 billion in federal taxes alone. They pay another $3.3 billion in state and local taxes each year. And given that, um, I think it, it also further highlights the relationship that the United States has with DACA recipients, which is that we take and we take and we take. We take taxes, we take their employment, we have over, um, you know, we, we have hundreds of thousands or, or yeah, 345,000 DACA recipients served as essential workers in 2021 during the COVID pandemic alone. I cannot believe this. The idea that this would somehow act as an incentive when any DACA eligibility ended in 2007, over a dozen years ago, is laughable. And as is, I believe, the premise that the American healthcare system is somehow some boon for working class people and the best in the world. What in the American exceptionalism is going on here? I do not know a group of people that oftentimes are more patriotic to this country than DACA recipients. They give and they give and they give to a country that does not love them back in their actions. Yet 74% of Americans, Republican and Democrat, believe in a path to citizenship for DACA recipients, for children who were brought here and made this place their home. These DACA recipients are emblematic of the American dream. They are America's proof of concept. And to strip and undermine that is to undermine ourselves in this institution. This shouldn't even be a question right now. And with that, I yield back. Many members of this body were neck deep in the January 6th insurrection, inspiring it, aiding, abetting, cheering, and after the fact, gaslighting about what it even was. This amendment is sadly necessary. They have openly fetishized guns and violence to the point where one of my colleagues across the aisle was removed from their committee assignments for portraying himself killing another member who sits on this very same committee. I am personally looking forward to moving past political stunts like this, like the one that you're proposing today, and his hypocrisy is on full display. It seems like my colleague from California forgot his tinfoil hat today, so brought this here for you just uh, as a little reminder. There are unhinged people, and we have to be able to stop that threat protect ourselves against it. I also noticed that the member from Colorado forgot to mention January 6th as also an assault on representatives. Yes, it was awful when Ashley Babbitt was murdered. Wow. And you don't care about the 100 other police officers. I reserve that right to defend myself. I reserve the right to carry my farm in whatever capacity I want to without your permission. Members have very different interpretations of these rules. They challenge these rules. And I think it's very, very important um, as our chair to understand what your specific interpretation of this is. Um, does the chair believe that members of Congress should, bring, should be able to bring firearms into the Natural Resources Committee or not? The chair believes that members of the Natural Resources Committee should follow the House rules and the guidance by yes, the Capitol Police. Yes, and the House rules. Um, members have different interpretations of what those rules are. I need to know for a sense of my own personal safety, what your interpretation of the House rules are as it pertains to this issue. I believe that would be a question you should take up with the House Administration Committee, and they do have a member's day, uh, as all committees do. So just to, in summary, the decision as to whether or not fire, or the chair believes that firearms are, should be permitted in this committee uh, is determined by House admin but the committee has not been in touch with House admin as to whether this should or should not be allowed. 
and uh, and so therefore, we're just going to leave this ambiguous. I believe it's up to every member of the House to follow the House rules. I just wonder if the gentleman from California or the gentle lady from New York has reason to believe that there is a homicidal maniac amongst us. Uh, if they do, uh, they probably would have brought a gun into this room, whether or not there is a law. And I would challenge them right now to present their evidence, name the names, and present the evidence before such a catastrophe confronts us. It's a mischaracterization. Um, I, while I am not here to impugn the character of any individual member of this committee. I do believe that uh, the performance oh, demonstrated has because shown a who, a... who who do you not trust to bring a firearm uh, in, into a committee room or anywhere else? In, in, I believe in that from what I've witnessed, um, the competence of some members may be something that I would be willing well, to question. I think you should give Thank us you. names before the sun goes down because we're all in great danger if you're correct. But if you're going to name names, I'd like you to present the evidence as well. And if not, uh, then uh, we should draw our own conclusion. Here's the deal. Before I even get into my questions, I think that the, the story here with the, New York, uh, with the Washington Post reporting is that what they're saying right here, when the New York Post first reported in October 2020 that it had obtained contents of a laptop computer allegedly owned by Joe Biden's son Hunter, there was an immediate roadblock faced by other news outlets that hoped to corroborate reporting, as many did. The newspaper wasn't sharing what it obtained. New York Post had this alleged information and was trying to publish it without any corroboration, without any backup information. They were trying to publish it to Twitter, Twitter did not let them, and now they were upset. I believe that political operatives who sought to inject explosive disinformation with the Washington Post couldn't get away with it. And now they're livid. And they want the ability to do it again. They want the ability to inject this again. So they've dragged a social media platform here in Congress. They're weaponizing the use of this committee so that they can do it again. A whole hearing about a 24-hour hiccup in a right-wing political operation. That is why we are here right now. Let's talk about something real. I'd like to show you a tweet posted by former President Trump about my colleagues and I on July 14, 2019. It says in part, quote, why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came? Then come back and show us how it's done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. I'm sure that Nancy Pelosi would be very happy as quickly to work out free travel arrangements. A day or two after that, uh, Donald Trump publicly uh, incited you know, violence at a rally, uh, targeting four Congresswomen, including myself, saying, go back to where you came from. Uh, Ms. Navarroli, as I understand it, you were uh, the most senior member of Twitter's content moderation team, or a senior member of Twitter's content moderation team when this was posted. Um, as part of your responsibilities, did you review this tweet? Yes, it was my team's responsibility to review these tweets. And what did you conclude? My team, Ray, made the recommendation that for the first time we find Donald Trump in violation of Twitter's policies and use the public interest interstitial. For the first time? Yes. And at the time, Twitter's policy included a specific example when it came to banned abuse uh, against immigrants as in, they specifically included the phrase, go back to your country or go, or go back to where you came from, correct? Yes, that was specifically included in the content moderation guidance as and an you, example. You brought this up to the vice president of trust and safety, Del Harvey, correct? I did, yes. And she overrode your assessment, didn't she? Yes, she did. Um, and something interesting happened after she overrode your assessment. A day or two later, Twitter seemed to have changed their policies, didn't they? Yes, that trope, go back to where you came from, was removed from the content moderation guidance as an example. So Twitter changed their own policy after the president violated it um, in order to potentially accommodate his tweet? Yes. Thank you. Um, so much for bias against right wing on Twitter. Uh, additionally, Ms. Navarroli, are you familiar with the account Libs of TikTok? I have heard of it from the news, yes. Um, Mr. Roth, are you familiar with this account? Yes, ma'am, I am. Are you aware from, that from August 11th to August 16th, that account posted false information about Boston Children's Hospital, claiming that they were providing hysterectomies to children? 
Yes, I am aware of that and other claims from the account. And are you aware that this lie was then circulated by other prominent far-right influencers? Yes. And are you aware that all these claims, uh, which I have reiterated were false, culminated in a real-life harassment and ultimately a bomb threat to the Boston Children's Hospital? Yes, I am aware. And this account is still on that platform today, isn't it? Regrettably, yes, it is. Despite inspiring a bomb threat due to the right-wing incitement of violence against trans Americans in this country, because they cannot let go of this obsession with fixating violence and inciting violence against trans and LGBT people, in addition to immigrants, in addition to women of color. This is a party that cannot pick on anyone their own size. And they are trying to co-opt an entire social media platform and use the power of this committee and of Congress in order to pursue a political agenda. I yield back. They don't believe in the, in the, in the actual enfranchisement and voting rights for DC residents who are US citizens, and yet we, they have the audacity and the gall to not just continue in that position and claim they believe in, in the sacred right to vote while denying that right to vote for an overwhelmingly black city, but then expanding their position, expanding their position so that in direct contradiction of their quote unquote conservative values of small government and defending freedom have decided to expand the jurisdiction of this body to meddle into the, the, the business of DC residents. The DC City Council has the right to determine its policies for DC residents. And if any member of this body does not like that, they, are feel, they can feel free to change their registration, resign their post, and run for DC City Council. And for those who are residents here of Washington, DC, they could have, as the ranking member stated, gone to any one of the many hearings on this issue. I understand that there may be disagreement. I understand that, uh, that, that Republicans may not be happy with what the DC City Council is doing. But when cities in Vermont pass the same provisions, when San Francisco, when nine Maryland cities brought up this provision, did the Republican Party corral all of Congress? They are singling out the residents of the District of Columbia and expanding in the history of disenfranchisement that goes all the way back to the legacy of slavery. And they're bringing it right here to this floor because why? They don't have any real bills to debate. We're not here to talk about health care. We're not here to talk about abortion. We're not here to talk about voting rights. We're here to talk about the expansion and the continued subjugation and disenfranchisement of the people of the District of Columbia. Let them govern themselves. And with that, I yield back to the ranking member. I'll start my remarks today by saying how ironic it is that we spent and Republicans spent the entire first week of this session entangled in a fight in order for them to get the votes uh, to, to secure a Speaker of the House. And the, ho the whole crux of that entanglement was, and part of it, was rules to maintain regular order in the House. Rules to maintain regular order. Because just as we go back to Schoolhouse Rock, you introduce a bill, it's supposed to go to committee, you get a markup on that committee, a hearing in that committee, a vote in that committee, and if that bill can survive a committee vote, it comes right here to the floor of this house. And we spent a whole week tied up in the beginning of this, uh, in the beginning of this term trying to reassert that order. And then, today, one of the first acts that we have from this oversight committee is to subvert that because perhaps they knew that this would not survive their own committee. And so it goes straight to the floor for a vote subverting all of those arguments that Republicans were making about restoring order to this House. But let's get into the substance of this bill. Ironically, if they had gone into this order, if they had gone through regular order, they may have caught that this bill does nothing to rein in inflation, in part because in their haste to put it together, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle committed an incredibly basic drafting error that makes this bill completely unenforceable. 
Even if we agreed on their ends, the, the haste and the rush to put this together and skip committee has created a drafting error that doesn't even make this bill enforceable. But even putting that error aside, my colleagues and I seem to have wildly different definitions of what actually is considered inflationary. Because of the American Rescue Plan and the actual Inflation Reduction Act that Democrats passed last year, our country's inflation rate is now lower than in the UK, Canada, and 20 other European Union member states. Yet Republicans have introduced legislation to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, which would immediately raise the price of insulin along with other critical prescription drugs. Tell me how that is fighting inflation when we are raising, when they're proposing to raise the costs of prescriptions. Not only did Republicans vote to raise prices on prescription drugs, but they also voted against measures to drive down the price of gasoline last year. Last year, Democrats presented a bill to penalize companies who were price gouging during the middle of Putin's war on Ukraine. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle voted against that too. So which one is it? Republicans have controlled this body for almost two months and have not passed a single bill that would actually address inflation or cut costs from working families. But you know what Democrats did? In January, we capped the price of, of insulin at $35 so that everyday working families can actually get a little bit more ahead. And we have a lot more to go. But we don't even see a carefulness on the first side of the aisle to even draft the language in this bill properly. Why sh it's not even ready for a vote. So why should we? And for that reason, I, I urge my colleagues to vote no on the so-called Rain In Inflation Act. And with that, I yield to the distinguished gentlewoman uh, of St. Louis, Cori Bush. We have about, what is it, seven, eight hearings uh, just in this committee and subcommittee slated this week, and which is a, you know, a very high number. And I, I have no qualms with this committee working hard. I have no qualms with this committee uh, doing everything that it can. But I think we need to have a conversation about priorities here. Making sure that, that OPM makes, uh, can, can create opportunities and federal careers for partners of military service members, that's woke. This is the woke alleged takeover that we have. That that we want wildland firefighters who are putting their lives at risk increasingly so year after year, that we wanna make sure that they stay on the job and have dignified conditions and not leave because they can earn more money as a greeter at Walmart. This is what is, this is what this whole term woke means. Or diversity and inclusion so that the people who work in our federal workforce are actually in proportion to the people that live in this country. This is this, this horrifying woke agenda that the other side is trying so hard to block. But you know, you know, on top of priorities, what I can't help but communicate that I find frustrating is that there are actual crises happening in this country. A couple weeks ago, there was a devastating, devastating derailment in, in East Palestine, Ohio. And yesterday, I was just lucky enough to wrap up a hearing early, and I was going back to my office. It was not scheduled. It, it wrapped up early. And there were people from East Palestine at my door because they weren't getting a response in, in their own other levels of government. And so they were just roaming around waiting for anybody to open their door to them to talk to them, any member of Congress to talk to them. And so we sat down, and they explained what's going on. And this committee needs to hold a hearing on what is on the derailment in East Palestine. This is not just a disaster site. It is a potential crime scene. People are poisoned, and their respiratory issues are getting worse day after day, and I, I, really, I'm, I, I really make this plea on a bipartisan basis, truly, I truly do. The chemicals that were spilled in East Palestine have short half-lives. Every day that we do not act on this is a day that the evidence evaporates from the scene. And I really plea for this committee to get together and not pursue this on a partisan basis. 
We need to have executives from the rail company, from Norfolk Suffolk here. We need to have independent scientists here. We need to have the EPA or whichever agencies, the CDC, DOT, whatever it may be, but this cannot be a political food fight. Evidence is evaporating and people are getting sick. And every day that we go on without this, without accountability, I mean, it's, it's not even partisan because in my view, and I'll take ownership as well, both parties are failing in this moment to address the needs of people. And I just sincerely ask that, that we take this seriously because it's not getting handled at the levels that it needs to be handled. We need to know why there hasn't been a disaster declaration that has been requested yet. You know, I do know that the president is, is willing to offer one, but we need to cut through the red tape. And if I can just make that plea, because I do believe that this committee, this committee, the oversight committee, has the unique jurisdiction and power in this body to be able to do that, to cut through that red tape. And so, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I sincerely make that plea, me as a Democrat, to you as a Republican, I, I really don't want us to drag this out because, again, the half-lives on these chemicals, the fo we don't let folks return to the scene of a crime. Yeah. And we've been letting that potentially, potentially, for, for almost a month now. So for the folks that are there, you know, and for the folks that, that came in yesterday, I just sincerely ask that, that we put things aside and we get to work. We had eight hearings this week. You know, we all showed up, we did this job, but, but let's get this to the top of the docket, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think what we're seeing here today is the Republicans' attempt, Republican Party's attempt to take some of the most heinous legislation that we are seeing passed on the state level to attack our trans and LGBT, as well as people from marginalized communities, right to exist in schools. This flowery language of quote unquote parental rights and freedom hides the sinister fact of this legislative text. If you notice in these arguments, they are not really discussing what is actually in this legislation. It includes two provisions that require schools to out trans, non-binary, and LGBT youth, even if it would put said youth in harm's way. One of the highest rates of youth homelessness is in, in the LGBT community. From parents who want to kick their children out in, in households that may be unstable or abusive. For so many children of abuse, school is their only safe place to be. But before they claim that this is not about banning books and not about harming the LGBT community, let's just look at the impacts of similar Republican legislation that has already passed on the state level. 40% of banned books have report, reported are significantly addressing and specifically addressing LGBT issues. To say and talk about government reach and freedom this is a legis this is a bill, this Republican bill is asking the government to force the outing of LGBT people before they are ready. And talking about the rights of parents in this gallery today, the National Parents Union is here saying don't do this. I have a letter that I'd like to submit where they are asking the Republican Party to keep culture wars out of classrooms. Our children need urgent and aggressive educational solutions. The American Library Association coming out against this Republican proposal. When we talk about progressive values, I can say what my progressive value is, and that is freedom over fascism. Thank General you very much. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentlewoman is recognized. I thank the ranking member, and uh, you know there was some discussion made earlier, an allegation that, that Democrats have yet to introduce any policy to reduce our energy costs as if we have completely forgotten about the sweeping multi-billion dollar investments in the Inflation Reduction Act to reduce people's costs across the board. But I'm rising today to stand in opposition to H.R. 1. You know, while Republicans try to claim that this is a bill to lower people's energy costs, we really see when you start digging into it that what this bill actually shows us uh, by the Republican authors is that they actually have no plan to reduce our utility bills or even prevent climate disaster in the United States. The central argument and logic of this bill is that if you give big oil 
everything they want, then perhaps they will lower, lower our gas prices. It's a form of trickle-down fantasy that just will not make life easier for everyday Americans. What HR1 will do is give big oil more leases of public lands. And this idea that an increased supply of fossil fuels will drive down prices is also mistaken. Let's look at what happened last year. We saw how, how big oil more than doubled its profits to $219 billion, all while price gouging customers at the pump, not because of supply issues, but because they can. Republicans opposed solutions that we even put forward, like a windfall tax on price gouging on big oil in order to prevent this kinds of behaviors. But fossil fuel companies, moreover, already have thousands of unused permits on public lands, and yet they want even more. This is not a problem of supply, it is a problem of greed and abuse of market power. For people following at home, if you are a member of the American public, if you are a tax-paying citizen, you are part of the ownership of our public lands. And when an oil company decides to lease that land, they are supposed to pay a royalty to the public. What does HR1 do? Slashes that royalty rate so that there is very little payback or investment into the American people and many of our programs. And despite the fact that more than 40% of Americans live in counties hit by climate disasters, this bill prohibits agencies from even considering climate change when deciding whether or not to issue a permit to a drilling company. None of these things are going to lower our costs at the pump. None of these things are going to actually reduce our utility bills. And in fact, in talking about this allegation of a lack of democratic proposals, Democrats introduced 95 amendments, proposed 95 amendments to this bill, and the Republican majority rejected all but seven. I myself personally sponsored an amendment in the spirit of this, uh, of, of this bill, allegedly, to try to reduce prices, and my amendment would have made sure that the subsidies that the federal government provides to oil and gas companies actually make their way to the American people instead of lining the pockets of billionaire CEOs, but actually having, and actually having the intended effect. But Republicans rejected that amendment too. They've made clear where they stand, and I could not emphasize enough how detrimental and damaging this bill would be, not only to the climate crisis, not only to, to, the, to the purpose of even trying to reduce our utility costs, but moreover, from the, the ability for the American people to actually receive an investment on the public lands that they lease out. And with that, I yield back to the ranking member. Senator Bach, I was hoping you could help me clarify something. Uh, I see here that you are testifying today as a former state senator, but we've seen some um, materials here that suggest you may be a registered lobbyist uh, within the state of Minnesota to, to lobby on behalf of Twin Metals Minnesota. I retired I, on June, on January 3rd, uh, and opened and started a consulting business, an LLC. I have a number of clients. Some of them require registration with the Minnesota Campaign Finance Board. And is uh, Twin Metals Minnesota Twin, one of those Twin clients? Metals is one of them, and I, dis I did disclose that. Okay, so is, was that disclosed with the state? I, I failed to see it in your opening statement. I failed to see it in uh, the, your, the statement you just delivered here. Um, and it is, to clarify, Twin Metals Minnesota, it is that company's leases that were canceled by the Biden administration that are partially subject to the matters of this hearing today. But I want to thank you. I think it's important for us to have clarity. Um, I am not sure why that detail was excluded. Um, I think it is highly relevant present experience that should be disclosed. Um, um, Ranking Member Ocasio-Cortez, it was disclosed in uh, his uh, written testimony. In his written testimony, in but not the opening statement. And, that, and it's required. Uh, that he did uh, disclose that. And, uh, okay, but I would like to note it was not included in the opening statement. Um, and Mr. Chura, you are employed by Minnesota Power, an elite company, correct? That's correct. And, but I'm here today representing jobs for Minnesotans. And um, 
Minnesota Power supplies electricity in northeastern Minnesota. Mines in northeastern Minnesota are one of the largest customers of Minnesota Power, correct? Correct. I would like to submit to the record here uh, an article uh, from the Star Tribune um, citing that 74% of Minnesota Power's energy does not go to Minnesotans. It goes to the taconite mines and paper mills. Um, so these mines are one of the largest customers of Minnesota Power. We've heard plenty on that so far, but I want to talk a little bit about the harms that this project would actually cause to the ecosystem and the people who live in the Boundary Waters area. You've shared that nearly 70% of Minnesotans support a permanent ban on sulfide ore copper mining in the Boundary Waters and Headwaters. How have, how have industry lobbying like what we've heard today distorted some of the on-the-ground community's perspective? Thank you, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, for your question. Um, I'm here as a volunteer. Uh, for the last 10 years, uh, constituents of Minnesota, oftentimes the 8th Congressional District, and also Americans from across the country, have been coming to Washington, D.C. to plead our case as volunteers, as people who love the Boundary Waters, who work in the Boundary Waters, have businesses there. Anna Fagasta last year spent over a million dollars on uh, lobbyists to uh, lobby within, uh, in Washington, D.C., in opposition to the volunteers like me that you're seeing here. And that doesn't count Mr. Bach, who's a Minnesota lobbyist. So there's been a significant uh, financial um, unevenness, if you will, mm -hmm. with the American people against this giant billionaire mining company. Ms. Ashland, did Enduring Resources pay any fines for impacts to land or water from that spill? Just simple, yes or no? No. 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 So the company did not uh, pay any fines for the impact of that spill. Uh, Mr. Atencio, did your family or your chapter ever hear at all from Enduring Resources about this bill? Ranking member, no, we have yet to receive any formal response from Enduring Resources. And I think this is something that speaks to a pattern that we have seen in front of this committee. To be clear, the kinds of pollution from that spill and a spill of that magnitude is profound with highly noxious, hazardous air pollutants and methane that either leak inadvertently or are vented or flared by operators. I have seen it in person. I have seen families burn when they breathe in some of this air. And in fact, so much methane spills out of industrial vents in the region that the methane cloud over New Mexico is now visible from space. We see this and it, hap it happens not just in this instance, but in many others where, where I have brought this point in front of this committee that people deserve to know if they are being poisoned, whether it's by accident or whether it's by any other process. And they are not being informed. They are not being told. The CDC also tells us that exposure to these pollutants can cause significant long-term health damage. Mr. Atencio, since the 2019 spill, have Enduring Resources or other oil and gas companies taken any steps to notify nearby communities of methane leaks, oil spills, or other incidents? No. And as Enduring Resources started building the infrastructure necessary to produce fossil fuels in the community, were you ever informed of the risk associated with these plants? No. Now, one thing I do want to speak to is the very real economic harm and injustice associated with this issue. Because Native people and indigenous communities have been abused and have not been respected. And in stripping everything away, we now are in an economic hostage situation where people feel like the only opportunity and that the only source is to, be, is to acquiesce to oil and gas. And the answer to that is not to revert back, to, in my view, not to revert back to that, but to invest and reinvest in these communities, particularly where there is harm being done, particularly where there is disinvestment being done. 
And if families are being impacted in these allotments, they deserve economic restitution. When I first heard that the Republican side was going to be calling a hearing on third party influence in our courts, I was so excited because I thought, finally, we are going to address the biggest scandal in American democracy currently having, that we are currently having right now, which is the extraordinary corruption and wholesale purchase of members of the Supreme Court. And um, I also find it amusing that we just heard from the Republican side, oh, why do we want to talk about this? Because women have lost the right to choose, because indigenous people have lost rights, because minorities have lost rights, because working people across the country have lost rights due to this level of corruption. I want to dig into a little bit about the influence here. In 2008, Leonard Leo, who's the head of the, um, who, who has ties to the Federalist Society, also organized a luxury fishing trip to Alaska, inviting, bil inviting a billionaire to join, Paul Singer. And when Paul Singer accepted, Leo asked if he could fly Justice Alito on his private jet to Alaska. So right here is Paul Singer, a billion, uh, a multi-billionaire and a uh, head of a hedge fund, works in hedge funds. And here is uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, AKA one of the justices turning over student loan cancellation, turning over women's rights to choose over their own body and more. Now, Professor Clark, are you familiar with five US code 13104? I'm so sorry, 5 U.S.C. 13104. Is, is that the new codification of the Ethics in Government Act? Yes, it's uh, to specifically on, um, and it requires reporting and disclosure requirements to government officials, yes. Yes. And I want to draw attention to uh, 13104A2A. This section requires disclosure of the identity of the source, a brief description, and a value of all gifts exceeding minimum value. Professor Clark, are you aware how much the minimal value of gifts was in 2008? Um, I would guess it would be about $400. Yeah, uh, a little bit under $335 uh, is the amount of gifts in, in gifts that Supreme Court justices are allowed to receive, which is actually bawling compared to members of Congress. We only are allowed to receive gifts under $50. So the Supreme Court, you can give them free AirPods, you can give them um, really nice dinners, and they don't have to report any of that. Um, but so we're clear, any gifts above that do need to be disclosed, correct? Correct. Yet, according to ProPublica's reporting, Justice Alito was flown on a private jet on this luxury trip, and if he had chartered a similar jet, it would have cost more than $100,000 each way. A hundred grand. Now, Professor Clark, with the cost of about $100,000 per flight, would Justice Scalia be required to disclose this trip? Um, I believe it, you're referring to Justice Alito. Alito, yes. And yes, uh, under the Ethics in Government Act, would be, disclosure would be required. And did he? My understanding is that he did not. He did not. So we have a billionaire who runs a hedge fund with business before the court. In fact, uh, we saw several cases before the court. And on top of that, he also had three days at a luxury retreat, which would charge over $1,000 a night. And he didn't disclose that either. Now, in the years uh, since, we've actually seen the billionaire who generously sponsored this trip, Paul Singer, did business before the court at least 10 times in cases where the legal press and mainstream media often covered his role. So it was publicly known that he had business before the court. And in 2014, in fact, uh, Justice Samuel Alito, along with the court, agreed to resolve a vital issue in a decades-long battle between Singer's hedge fund and the nation of Argentina. And do you know if Alito recused himself from this case? I believe he did not. He did not recuse himself from this case. And in fact, he used his seat on the Supreme Court after all of this to rule in Singer's favor. And following the decision, Mr. Singer's hedge fund was ultimately paid $2.4 billion because of this ruling. Not a bad return on investment for a uh, fishing trip there. Now, Professor Clark, would a federal judge in a lower court expired. be required to recuse himself? The gentleman's time has expired. May I answer the question, sir? 
I think uh, the discretion of the chair, yes, you can answer Thank the question. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, there's a federal statute, I believe it's 28 U.S.C. 455, that does require Sorry. recusal by both justices and judges under certain circumstances. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, it has been repeated, and I would also like to repeat that the allegations being presented uh, by the majority are extremely serious, and the prospect of impeachment is also a gravely serious matter, which has been echoed by our witnesses today. And any serious impeachment investigation or inquiry relies on firsthand sworn testimony of witnesses to high crimes or misdemeanors. Today, the Republican majority has called in three witnesses to advance their case. Mr. Turley, I have a simple question for you. In your testimony today, are you presenting any firsthand witness account of crimes committed by the President of the United States? No, I'm not. No, you are not. Ms. O'Connor, you are the second uh, Republican witness here today. Have you, in your testimony, presented any firsthand witness account of crimes committed by, pre by the President of the United States? I have not. Thank you. Now, Mr. Dubinsky, as the third and final Republican witness uh, in this hearing, have you, in your testimony, presented any firsthand witness account of crimes committed by the President of the United States? Uh, I have not. And Professor Gerhardt, uh, given that you are the minority witness, I assume the same, correct? I am not a fact witness, correct. Thank you. And to clarify, two individuals presented today who do have firsthand accounts surrounding the progeny of these allegations are being blocked from testifying by the Republican majority. And I want to explain why this is important. Members of Congress, all of us in this hearing, are not under oath, as we are presently covered by the speech and debate clause. Isn't that correct, Professor Gerhardt? That is correct. And the speech and debate clause covers all statements by a member of Congress, whether they are factual or not. There are only four people in this room that are presently under oath in their testimony. And those are the four witnesses here today. Is that correct, Professor Gerhardt? That is correct. And so the direct testimony of the four individual witnesses here today are the bona fide words that this committee must use in order to proceed or substantiate an investigation. The impeachment inquiry, any impeachment inquiry, regardless of party, is an extremely serious matter. Professor Gerhardt, in the impeachment inquiry under, um, into, into President Clinton, were there key fact witnesses that were presented in, during those proceedings? There were not in the House. Mm -hmm. In the Senate, were there any? There were. There were in the Senate. Now, in the impeachment, uh, in, in the impeachment investigations with, uh, with, President, with respect to President Trump, were there key material fact witnesses in the House? Y yes, ma'am. There were. Are there any key material fact witnesses here today? No, ma'am. None. And so we are wasting our time. When we talk about a threshold of an impeachment inquiry, was there a House floor vote that had a majority of members of Congress that opened an impeachment inquiry into President Clinton? There was. There was. Was there a full House floor vote uh, opening an impeachment inquiry into President Trump? In 2019. Is there one here for this one? Not for this one. There is not one here for this one. This is an embarrassment an embarrassment to the time and people of this country. And I would ask that the chair and I would ask that this committee elevate to the promise of our duties here and, and comport ourselves with the consistency and practice that is required of our seats and our duty and our, our oath to our, to our responsibilities here. And with that, I yield back. Uh, you know, much of the Republican case and evidence has uh, relied on words from Hunter Biden. Um, Hunter Biden said this, Hunter Biden said that, therefore, case closed, there's something here. Um, Professor Gerhardt, uh, we know, I believe it's wide knowledge with the public, that uh, Hunter Biden uh, sadly was dealing with substance misuse uh, disorder, correct? Correct. He's been under indictment, correct? Correct. Is this a reliable witness that you would deem? Um, it, it, uh, probably not. In your assessment? Kittles, ladies, times Thank you very much. Let me tell you what's actually going on. New York Republicans are so embarrassed 
that they propped up George Santos, got him elected to office, and then had to turn around and vote to expel him, that they want to distract the entire world from their massive embarrassment. New York Republicans are so embarrassed that they have not accomplished a damn thing for New Yorkers this entire year that they have to find a distraction. So they've decided to target one of the first black men to ever represent Westchester County in the United States Congress for censure. That is what today is about. And New York Republicans are so unfocused and so unable to make people's lives better that they've decided to bully their colleague. That's what today is about. They're wasting our time. They're wasting the country's time over some petty, what rises to censure? I mean, truly, these arguments that are being made here, what's next? Jaywalking? Do you want to get us for, for jaywalking? For not crossing the street correctly? Is that what you're going to raise for censure next? This is truly ridiculous. It's beneath the character of the House, and it is beneath the stature and the status of what rises to consideration before this body. And with that, I yield back. You know, I've spent... Um, decent amount of my time here in Congress sitting through panels and hearings of men attempting to restrict the rights of women and telling us that it's for our own good. Um, but I want to dive a little bit more deeply into why this issue with targeting trans women in sports is particularly problematic, not just for trans girls, but for all of us. We're here today because there's a proposal here, and there are several proposals here, uh, to further marginalize trans women in sports. And I think about this all the time, because trans people in the United States doesn't even exceed 1% of our population, and yet there is so many resources and energy and time dedicated to figuring out how we can more finely exclude them um, from our sports. And I thought, why, why? Why so much effort and dedication on such a tiny portion of the U.S. population when there virtually is no major issue that is, um, that is precipitating? And I started to realize that a lot of these proposals here um, involve invasion of privacy of all women. Ms. Goss Graves, can you tell us a little bit about what sex testing looks like for youth in states with trans athletic bans? It, it's terrible. Uh, in some states, any individual could challenge whether someone is a girl enough to play. In some states, it requires actual a genital verification, which is shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't it's not as if they're... Okay. And let me just stop you right there. You said there are some proposals. I mean, we've seen this in Ohio. There was a proposed ban on trans athletes that originally allowed for genital examinations on minors in order to, quote, unquote, protect women. Is that correct? Unfortunately, yes. And so we're seeing here in this guise, under the guise of not only trying to further marginalize trans women and girls, we are talking about opening up all women and girls to genital examinations when they are under age. That's right. Potentially just because someone can point to someone and say, I don't think you're a girl. That's correct. And we're saying this in an environment of a post-Dobbs America where states are criminalizing access to abortion and want nothing more than data on women to figure out when, who's getting a menstrual cycle, who doesn't have one, and we're supposed to believe that this is gonna make us better and safer? I think not. And per usual, I don't believe we're sitting here in a panel of men that has actually thought of, about the biology and privacy consequences of all women, trans or cisgender, here. Ms. Gossgraves, in addition to that, are there certain groups more likely to face discrimination under these bans? When well, it comes to, and, and what you were speaking to, particularly when it comes to black women and girls? 
Yeah, we, we have seen that there are examples of uh, black women who are even professional athletes whose bodies have been more examined and demonized. We've seen that with my fan favorite, Serena Williams, whose body is often mm -hmm. talked about. Um, that sort of challenging them for who they are uh, if it is codified into law, mm. is something that we would expect to see more. And, and this also deeply intersects with a secondary issue, which is racial bias in the medical field. When we have vast proportions of populations that have been studied and tested are not right racially or otherwise identity-based representative of the broader US population. And so what gets determined as a norm oftentimes gets pegged to largely white populations that have been studied, and then black women and girls are then further subject to, to um, marginalization. This, this has been in your experience and what you've seen as well, right? That's correct. I'm supposed to believe that this is who's looking out for my best interests? I think not, and to that I yield back. <laughs>